your source for everything paranormal. Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet, everybody, and welcome. Now, tonight we're going to be consorting with author Jason Miller, and in turn, he's going to be talking about his new book, Consorting with Spirits. Now, Jason has spent the last 35 years studying practical magic in its many forms, He's the author of six books, including the now classic Protection and Reversal Magic. He teaches several courses online, including the Strategic Sorcery One-Year Course, the Sorcery of Hecate, and the Black School of St. Cyprian. Any questions and comments are welcome during the show, and if you'd like to join us here in the chat room, you can come over to paraxradionetwork.com and click on Chat Now. Now, Jason has been my guest over the years um, with most of it, or not all of it, but most of it's been magic books, magical books. But can support Consorting with Spirits is a guide um, to working with invisible allies. Now, even though that it's magical in its own right, some people might wonder why Jason switched gears from magic to spirits this time around, but in truth, that's not the case. So, Jason, welcome back, and would you like to address the allegation that you might have ventured into uncharted territory? Oh, goodness. (laughs) Spirits are part of magic. Um, You know, magic is... Everybody has these very simple models. First of all, hi, thank you for having me back, (laughs) Marla. You're welcome. Um, So, you know, you were one of the first shows that ever had me on so I, I always look forward to coming back um but you know people have these ideas about well magic works with energy or magic works about with the mind and then other people say magic is works only through spirits like spirits are how magic works and all of these are very they're they're small they're, they're, it's like saying a car works on gasoline and not on electricity. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. this is all part of a whole. It's all part of magic. So, you know, in previous books, I've talked about Hecate and I've talked about invoking guardian spirits and so on. So in this book, we're just focusing in on relationships with spirits and and how those serve over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know that the book's title, Consorting with Spirits, was actually the name of a crime back in the 17th century. But I, I, I mean, why all of a sudden did it become a crime when people have been consorting with spirits since ancient times or perhaps even the beginning of time? Well, you know, the easy answer is, of course, the, the, the church and the Inquisition and the influence of Christianity, um, it, that it's been a crime. But, you know, there have been periods um, under, you know, Roman paganism and, and various administrations, and, uh, you know, in pre-Christian Greece and so on, where magic was a crime and, and having illicit... Uh, relationships with spirits was a crime. So it always all boils down to which spirits, really, right? Like, if you're if you're having visions of angels, then that's probably okay. 
But if it's like local spirits or, or something like that, then the church frowns on it. But it has always been so that, you know, what the other people believe is probably evil and wrong and nasty. Um, so, but yeah, that was, uh, that was the thinking behind it being a crime. And, and so Mm -hmm. I wanted to pay a little homage to that, uh, with the title. And of course, I also wanted to pay homage to the idea that magicians and sorcerers and, and, and witches, uh, we don't just summon a spirit once and then that's it. We form these relationships, right? We we go, they be, spirits become part of our lives. Mm-hmm. And so that's the other meaning of consorting, that, that somebody is out and about forming relationships with probably, you know, undesirable people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there are some out there. Um, but, yeah, okay, I did something... I, that I don't normally do. Um, when I read chapter one of the book, um, which is called So What is a Spirit? It kind of piqued my interest. I mean, you know, you said what it was and, and you know, you explained a whole lot. But um, before I read your answer to that, I decided to get in touch with four very diverse friends of mine from all walks of life and belief systems and ask them to tell me what they define spirits as. So I'm going to quickly read what each one of them wrote or said um, because the answers were quite interesting. I don't think every, I think everybody has kind of a different idea about spirits. So the first one was a witch, and okay. she said it probably depends on personal experience. Those who have never heard, seen, or felt spirit would most likely call them ghosts, if anything at all. Those of us that have regular interactions will divine spirits perhaps by activity or define it by activity. She says she's a singleton, and I acknowledge spirits as any non-physical entity that I interact with. Yet there are spirits who reside in living plants and flowing water, so it's hard to pin it down. So that was her. Good, I like it. All right. Now, I've got a Catholic bishop. Um who um, is also an exorcist, by the way. So Mm -hmm. I thought that would be interesting. He said, the soul and the spirit are not the same. The body needs the spirit in much the same way as a radio needs electricity in order to function. When you put batteries in it and turn it on, the electricity stored in the batteries brings the radio to life, so to speak. Without batteries, however, the radio is dead. Similarly, the spirit is the force that brings our body to life. Also, like electricity, the spirit has no feeling and can't think. It's an impersonal force. But without that spirit or life force, our bodies expire back to the dust they go, as the psalmist says, stated, sorry. Um, The soul is is the very essence of humankind. It's the cogito, (laughs) I I hate that word, Um, the think, the think, therefore I am. It's, mm-hmm. it's it's the intellect, the very essence of a human person. The spirit is the energy that is omitting from the individual. So that was right. So he, he's giving basically the catechism answer of a uh, body, soul, and spirit. Yes. So it, 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 which um, is is fair enough. And and certainly (laughs) plays somewhat into my answer, but yeah, in a way, yeah. So there's a very Catholic uh, meaning behind that. Mm Mm-hmm. And of course, that that more of like spiritus meaning breath, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the the next one was a fairly well known ghost hunter, Um, and he said. The way I interpret the spirit is that it forms a delicate but formidable part of the human trinity, that is, soul, body, spirit. We just talked about that. The spirit is, in essence, I believe, a part of the source, God, if you like, that experiences life while on this plane. It's purely experimental and at point of death is released from the trinity to return to the source. Our communication with spirit is negligible at best. Once it's gone, it's gone. The information we've garnered to create our vision, or 
our version of the afterlife is given to us by the soul. That's a totally different fish. Not right. So, so the, it's, it's sort of the difference between asking what spirit is and what spirits are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. All right. And finally, um, I asked a psychiatrist friend of mine. And he's very short but sweet. (laughs) He said, the spirit is the psyche's last line of defense against the cold oblivion of death. (laughs) Yeah, that was that. So, all right, it's your turn. How did you define what a spirit is? So, we, we have to kind of take one step back and separate spirit from spirit. Because mm-hmm. that's where the confusion comes in. The witch answered what spirits are. The other three answered what spirit is. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, you know, there's the spirit in the body, in energy. There's there's team spirit, right? There's, you know, that kind of thing. But I that's not what we mean when we say spirits. Now, that said... Um, I define spirits simply as organized consciousness, uh, which means you and I are spirits, and ghosts are also spirits, and there are spirits of nature, and there are uh, spirits that don't have anything to do with anything on Earth particularly. There are spirits organized around all kinds of different principles. And so we get vast, powerful spirits like angels and gods and so on that are organized both according to a principle like expansion and or, or thunder and, and wealth and, uh, and also culture, right, mm-hmm. that interfaces and organizes. Whereas you and I are organized right now around the body. Uh, there might be a spirit inhabiting the local tree or stream that is organized by that as well. So um, there is a, a wide variety of what spirits are. Uh, and but the simplest explanation is organized consciousness. Okay. So the idea of spirit could be one element in any, any number of spirits, right? Like a Mm -hmm. being that is a spirit might have spirit in the sense that the other folks mean it. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the book teaches readers many things, um, including evaluating spirit messages, modes of manifesting, um, different ways of interacting with spirit, different modes of contact, um, tools um, to establish and maintain a long-term relationship with spirit modes. And I want to get to those some of those things a bit deeper, but right now, um, I I, I was really interested in how you, your experience was in making contact with your holy sure. guardian angel because it just doesn't happen overnight, does it? No, not in the way that um, that most magicians mean it uh, when they talk about what they call the the K and C of the HGA. The Knowledge and Conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Uh, you know, everyone has a Holy Guardian Angel. Um, and, and anyone can pray to the Holy Guardian Angel and propitiate the Holy Guardian Angel and occasionally receive messages from the Holy Guardian Angel. But there's a particular way of thinking about the Holy Guardian Angel that goes back to a book called The Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Maid by uh, Abraham of Worms. 
And it details a, an operation that lasts for 18 months. Old translations, uh, the, the early, first translations of it in English suggested six months. But the better translations detail that it's uh, three periods of six months, not just six months. Mm -hmm. So over the course of time, the magician sets out to not just have some contact or some light experience or something like that, but to really have an intimate encounter that establishes a long-term relationship with the Holy Guardian Angel. So when I lived in Philadelphia back in the 90s, back in the era before marriage and kids and career where there's a little, you know, there's less money but a lot more freedom. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went to undertake this, and I, I spent a huge bulk of every day alternating between prayer and meditation, uh, calling out to the Holy Guardian Angel. And at the time, I was following the model that it took six months, and I didn't get there in six months. It took me nine months. So I don't actually believe that there's any kind of firm timeline that you can really put on this. I don't care what the book says. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, been, you know, since that book was written, there are various different approaches to it. But um, when it happened, it was a very profound and, and overwhelming experience. And, and the funny thing is, um, when it happened and the angel appeared in a way that was just more visceral than almost any encounter with a spirit I had had before. Mm -hmm. And it immediately said, you know, so now that we have contact, tomorrow night you have to go about binding the demons in my name, which is the next step in, in the, the book. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I don't, consider that like a real thing like it aren't isn't the holy guardian angel just a part of my mind after all you know this is how a lot of people thought of these things uh back in the 90s mm -hmm. and uh so i'm doing this and i'm i'm you know the angel is like no no i'm not just a part of your brain and yeah actually you do need to bind these <laughs> they're not just you know, inconvenient, uh, you know, symbolism, the, the fact that you now have an open connection to me will kind of feed these demons that are around you. So you need to make a clear connection uh, and, and to the, the demon kings and make it so that nothing under their control can act wildly with all this kind of new power. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, running like a stronger electrical current to your house, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to then make sure everything in the house doesn't blow. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, and I was like, but, but, you know, I'm unprepared. I don't, you know, I was supposed to prepare like a ring to, to do all this with. And the Holy Guardian Angel said, it's okay, um, you know, by tomorrow night you will have the thing to use to, to bind the, de the demons unto. And so the next night, uh, some friends of mine are over that are magicians, and one of them brings me this giant five-foot-tall Egyptian wasp staff. This is the, the sort of the jackal-headed staff. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. So he made this gorgeous thing um, for himself and then decided to give it to me, mm -mm. Um, which was, you know, incredibly generous and also fulfilled what the Holy Guardian Angel said would happen to the, left, to the, to the hour. Mm -hmm. like by tomorrow night, <laughs> You'll have the thing you need to do this. And there it is. Uh, so definitely not just uh, parts of the brain 
coming together, you know? Mm -hmm. It was just, it's kind of amazing. Now, I have a question about something that that somebody from the chat room had a question about, too. But first of all, I'm going to ask you, how does the holy guardian angel differ, differ from regular guardian angels? Well, you know... Or is there a difference? Well... See, this is this is one of those things where everyone has different ways of classifying this. Mm-hmm. And not just this, but but all the spirits. And, yeah. and you know, if you if you talk to even just within, say, you know, Christianity or Catholicism, there will be seven different classifications of angels and demons that I can think of from different theologians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've kind of come around to this idea that of don't know, don't care. Um, (laughs) Things are what they are. And I think that magic and spirituality and religion is really good at showing meaning and showing usefulness. But when it comes to establishing the facts of how things are, I think it's fairly terrible at it. (laughs) Um, And and so, you know, what is a guardian angel? What is the holy guardian angel? Is the holy guardian angel that I made contact with exactly the same as if I had followed a bromelain to the letter? And these are kinds of things that I've just let go of. Um, Mm -hmm. because I don't have any faith in any of them, and I don't think that they're useful or or terribly meaningful. It's just like crap for people to argue over. (laughs) Well, that's true, and that gives them a good reason. What what is a guardian angel? You know, uh, Mm -hmm. it could be a nature spirit that helps somebody out. It could be a literal angel set over a town by God, or a state by God, or a church Mm -hmm. by God. Yeah. Or it could, or any particular god. It could be a a you know. It all depends upon the spirits that you're connected with and the spirits that you are um, the the lens that you choose to filter all this through. Okay. And so the holy guardian angel that that the working is about is really. The, it, it is almost really a part of you, but not you, the ego of this life, right? Mm-hmm. So it's almost like your personal angelic connection to divinity. Okay, because the, the chat room question was, so what's the difference between contacting spirits and spirit guides? Uh, again, if a spirit guides you, then it's a spirit guide. If it doesn't <laughs> guide you, then it's just a... You know, and maybe it guides you, but it, but it guides you wrongly, and it's a crappy spirit, right? <laughs> um, they come in all shapes and sizes. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it, it's kind of amazing because when I when I just sat back a couple of years ago and I said, you know, head, heart, and hand. Um, the head wants to know where things are, what they are, how to classify them, and just nail them down. The heart wants to know what things mean and how they feel, and the hand wants to know how things are useful. And I just thought, you know, um, philosophy, magic, religion, excellent at the heart and the hand, really kind of craptastic at facts, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I think about even Plato and Aristotle, right? They gave us so much that is meaningful that we still discuss today because it it has meaning for how we frame our lives and think about things. And there's usefulness there too, right? There's there's Mm -hmm. useful ideas that that can be enacted and practices and so on. But when it comes down to like how everything works, they were wrong on almost every count, right? But thinking that they must be right held us back for over a thousand years because goodness, the, the the earth can't revolve around the sun. That would mean Plato was wrong. 
Mm -hmm. Planets can't move in ellipses. It has to be circles. Or Aristotle was wrong, and that can't be. So, yeah, I, um, I, I hate to sidestep the questions, but I sidestep the questions of <laughs> what's the spirit versus the spirit guide versus, you know. Well, yeah, and I've got now another question that's kind of similar, but not exactly. I mean, she says, how can a person determine with certainty that a spirit is their guardian instead of just a spirit that talks in your ear about good things? So let's let's talk about this now, how, because I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. um, how do I determine with certainty that the spirit is telling me the truth? How do I know that it is a spirit and it's not just my mind? How do I mm -hmm. know that it's not some local spirit and that it really is the spirit it says it is? All this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so here's my answer. How do we do this with people? Like, that's the answer. How do you do this with people? So what was, what was the reader's question again exactly? How can a person determine with certainty that a spirit is their guardian instead of just a spirit that talks in your ear about good things? How do you determine that somebody giving advice is has your best interests at heart versus somebody who just gives crap advice. How, you know, like, how, mm -hmm. how do you determine if it's your guardian? Does it have to be your guardian? Does that matter? Like, that it's yours and yours alone, personal, something like that? Or, like, if it's good advice, then it's good advice. If it's meaningful or useful, then you can see, is there something actionable? here, right? And mm -hmm. does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so you evaluate it just like information from people. We, mm -hmm. We've developed these skills to evaluate what people say to us based upon who they are, who, you know, how they present themselves to us and, and uh, whether what they say makes any kind of sense. But then when it comes to spirits and gods, we throw all this out the window. Mm -hmm. and, and just like, well, it, you know, we either instantly doubt or we think it must be true and that we have to take the advice, even though, you know, Uncle Frank might not be any better with money now that he's dead than he was when he was alive. So, you know, do you, is it really smart to take his advice? He, mm -hmm. He's a spirit. Um, so my advice is always evaluate the information more than worrying about whether the spirit is this spirit or that spirit or, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't ever really nail that down. Right. Um, even people you, that you know in your life. You don't really know that they are who they say they are. Not always. Marla, have you ever watched Mad Men? No. <laughs> it's no. Terrible. I know. I haven't. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm, for for any listeners out there who watch Mad Men, and and I'm gonna give a little spoiler from like you know early in the season. You find this out. It's not a big deal. But but the main character Don Draper is not really Don Draper. He's somebody else. Um, and he took over this guy's life in, in the war, and, you know, since he came back, he has been Don Draper, this famous advertising executive. And somebody finds this out, and they go to his boss, and they expose him. And the boss just looks, and he's like, who cares? Like, you are, like, you are the person that you're in, you're, a person is who they are in the room. And I assure you, this is Don Draper. Because what does it change if his name is somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Is what he's doing for us good? Is it useful? Is it meaningful? And if, it's, if it is, then what difference does it make what his real name is? Mm -hmm. So that's how it is with spirits. 
That's a good analogy. We'll call it the yeah. Mad Men rule or the Don Draper rule. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, there's so many things in there I want to talk about, but we're not going to have time to talk about any of everything. But um, one of the things that jumped out at me was um, friendly conjuring because, you know, when people – go on ghost hunts, you know, there are a lot of people that go out there and they start to bully the ghosts, you know, disrespect, demand, and, you know, scream at them and and whatever. So so what is friendly conjuring? So, you know, there's, you've got, you've got friendly conjuring and you've got conjuring with constraint, right? So friendly Mm -hmm. conjuring is laying out some offerings and inviting a spirit to come and, and, and partake of those offerings, uh, may, asking it if you want it to do something or if you want to communicate, opening up those lines of communication in a more or less friendly fashion. It is the spiritual equivalent of uh, holding a cocktail party and inviting people over, Right. Mm-hmm. They, you're not forcing anyone to come, but they come. Now, the opposite, the other side of friendly conjuring is, of course, unfriendly conjuring or conjuring through constraint or fierce con- conjuration. Mm-hmm. Well, you need that, too, because what if somebody shows up at the cocktail party and they start they get a couple drinks in them and then they start to get violent, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to either call the police or you need to be able to throw them out on your own and, and, or have a big friend nearby to, to toss them out. I've been the big friend a couple times and, and I've had other friends for me, but, um, yeah. So sometimes you need the carrot and sometimes you need the stick, but more often than not, it's better to start off on a friendly footing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of, of the ghost hunting and the paranormal. It, it's, it's almost, it strikes me like, I don't know, they're playing ding dong ditch with the spirits. Like, you know, contact us. Oh, we're here because we want them. We've heard that there's a spirit here. And then like, they feel a cold breeze and the spirit shows up and they're like, ah, evil, fight it, destroy it. You know, and it's like, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, with those uh, people, it's like lack of education, lack of knowing what they're doing, basically, isn't it? Yes. And, you know, it, it makes for an exciting, you know, psychic soap opera. But, um, but yeah. So it's not that bad things never happen, but you don't go into most situations assuming that bad things happen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's good to be able to to have, you know, in certain situations, you want to have the ability to just, you know, force somebody to do what you want them to do, right? Mm-hmm. If you run mm-hmm. a classroom... You you can't let people just act whatever way they want. You have to, if you run a business, if you if you do anything, mm-hmm. um, there are certain situations where you have to exert power. Mm-hmm. But not every situation. Like I don't go in to order a coffee and like take the barista and throw him up against the wall and say, <laughs> you know, mix me my coffee or I'm going to slit your throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's Kind, like people have this really either or mentality when it comes to spirits. Mm-hmm. So they, you, I've heard, you know, oh no, no, the, you know, like spirits are evil, and you really have to constrain them, or they will ruin your life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to which I've always been like, that doesn't make any sense. That mm-hmm. there's just hordes of things out there waiting to destroy you at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, then you have people that are like, oh, well, you know, all the spirits are are sweetness and light and goodness, 
And, you know, one should never exercise constraint or, you know, any kind of forceful conjuration is just imperialistic thinking. And it's sort of like, well, no, you need to be able to set boundaries and keep those boundaries, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm an advocate of having walking softly and carrying a big stick. Mm-hmm. That's the right way to go. Um, you know, people, um, <clears throat> it, it, we know it takes discipline and training to work with spirits, but some people get impatient. And amongst the many rituals and exercises that you have in the book, and there are some really, really good, well, they're all good, but, you know, um, <laughs> I didn't mean to say one was better than the other. But one um, well, called... Some must be better than others. Well, maybe, um, but they're all good. Um, but the one that was called Looking Past the Veil, to me, caught my eye because for anybody that's um, impatient and doesn't want to take the time or something, this is an exercise that can be done anywhere, um, and anybody can do it. And could you explain how to do it or, or walk them through it is like right. in a couple of minutes? Will that work? Let's do it right now. Okay. Everybody listening, just just. Stop what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and here, here's, here's how this simple thing works, right? So wherever you are, I want you to look forward. Just take a couple deep breaths. Calm your mind a little bit. You don't have to calm it too much, you know. And just look ahead of you. Like, get still and look ahead of you. Right now, I'm looking at my desk. It's got a couple statues. It's got blinds. There's some lights that I can see uh, through the woods in, in, in the dark uh, out the window. That's what I see. And it doesn't really matter because whatever is in front of you, I want you to consider that it's, it's flat. You're looking at a two-dimensional surface like a painting or as if it was a painting of whatever it is you're looking. It's, it's, it could be, you could think of it as a flat screen, like, right? A giant flat screen that you can't see the edges of. Um, it looks 3d, but in reality, it's two dimensions. It's all there on a screen, just like, like, like the painted backdrop of a play, right? The yellow brick road is on the floor and then it continues off into, uh, you know, the scenery that is painted on, uh, on the wall. Mm -hmm. So just take that moment and imagine that everything in front of you is two dimensional. And then take another deep breath, just relax the mind and reach out with your feelings for what is on the other side of that screen? What is on the other side of that? Say hi. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, see what you get. See if you see anything, if you hear anything. Another neat trick to try with this is as you're contemplating this screen, Consider how your brain processes information, how it how it's hearing all the sounds it, it hears or, or seeing everything in front of it and follow it back out, right? Like you mm -hmm. can, you can, uh, you know that in your brain is where all of this is really becoming something that you know. So how does it go from the ears to the brain and the eyes to the brain? Follow that trail back out and then reach beyond that screen. What is on the other side? So this simple exercise, what it does is it takes our ordinary perception of three dimensions of space and it breaks, it drops it down into two dimensions. That's all it does. It's not... It, it's not anything more than that. But what that does is it creates a vacuum in perception because we're used to perceiving three dimensions of space. So if we can take everything that's three-dimensional 
and say, actually, no, I'm going to, it's, it's flat. It's on a TV screen. It is two dimensions that I'm looking at, not three. Suddenly our mind has the ability to jump beyond into a dimension it normally can't conceive of. And that window is often a nice opening for spirits. Um, the local spirits where you are, or a spirit that you've prayed to or invoked, or, just, you know, if you're pious, the still small voice of God might be on the other side of that. If you're nature oriented, it could, you know, maybe it's the, the spirit of the land that you live or the spirits in the land that you live that, that you want to make contact with. That's a useful tool I have found uh, for doing it. Just be <laughs> warned, it does make some people nauseous for some reason. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's all part of the game. I mean, you know, get used to it. It, it, it is, you know. I remember teaching it a long time ago and, like, somebody threw up. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> like, oh my god, I must have been doing it wrong. And I'm like, no, I think you're probably doing it really, really well. <laughs> yeah, you're doing it too. You're an overachiever. Yeah, I can see <laughs> right, that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it a good idea to conjure demons? Oh, it can be. Depends <laughs> okay. on depends on what your needs are and and your. Um, and and your your attitude towards them. Um, now you know my attitude towards uh, demons and the devil and and all of that. If I'm if I'm to take up that um, that heaven and hell binary at all, uh, which I think is ultimately again something that can be meaningful, something that can be useful, but not something that is empirically true, that I'm out there saying, yes, yes, this is how it is. But if I'm to take that up, um, you know, I tend to think of the rebel angels and the demons as very individualistic spirits, whereas angels are collectivist spirits. And I think there's a role for both. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think about, think about yourself as a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Did you rebel, Marla? Did you, did you do <clears throat> any healthy rebellion? Who, me? Oh, of course yeah. not. Uh-huh. Of course not. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm sure you were, you were, you were perfect, but, but most of us rebel. I was, bit, you know? I was hell on wheels for a while. So yeah, <laughs> we're good. Of course you were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the thing is, that's healthy, yeah. right? Yeah. Because so you're, you're raised as a child with the rules. These are the rules, and you follow the rules. And, you know, the rules were chosen to keep you safe and to answer some basic questions and give you parameters to, to make decisions. But then you get to a point where of your growth where you need to test the boundaries, mm -hmm. right? And so you rebel. Now then you arrive through that at adulthood where now you know, well, some of those rules my parents had were actually really wise. And I understand them even better for breaking them because now I see it's not just a rote rule that I had to obey, but there's a real wisdom there. Some of it you might decide is a big stinky heap of BS that you no one should have ever bought into. Mm -hmm. um, and, and both of those are great. Both of those are fine. And your parents still love you. And, you know, as my kids get into their teenage years, I'll be going through this, and they will frustrate the hell out of me, and I will love them all the way through it. Mm -hmm. And so, and, the, and, and recognize that the rebellion has a role. Just like individualism and freedom has a role, but so does collectivism and common good. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I view angels and demons. You know, mm-hmm. are you are you doing something very individualistic? Uh, it doesn't have to be evil. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be dark. It doesn't have to be. Uh, some people say wrathful or hot. It doesn't have to be any of those things. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, there is a, another partial question to that from the chat room. It says, so so then what are the consequences for making a deal with the devil? Um, depends on what your deal is. Right? Can can you barter? <laughs> okay. Of course. Of course you can barter. You can well. say, you know, hey, uh, give me, you know, something and I'll offer you a stick of incense. Oh, that was Take getting away it. cheap. Yeah, okay. I thought well, maybe there's no guarantee it'll, it'll, that, that anything will bite, right? Uh, but this idea that, that, you know, the devil is out for your soul, it's just, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, who is the devil? Who were the demons? I mean, you know, it's all in what you kind of believe in. And, and you know, people listen to what other people say. And sometimes other people don't say the right thing. So you have to use your own gut and and decide what's what, what's right, what's wrong, and what works for you. And that's kind Absolutely. of my thing. Yeah. All right. We got a couple more minutes. Um, so um, didn't get to everything we want to talk about. Maybe we'll do this again. Um, but what's the most important thing that people need to know about consorting with spirits? Oh. The most important thing people need to know about consorting with spirits is that most of your questions can be answered by asking yourself, how would I do this or act if this was a person? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really like the big deal. Like that's the big deal. Uh, And the other thing is not to fall into extremes. Uh, it's it's almost never an either or. It's never it's never good and evil. It's never uh, force or or not force. It, mm-hmm. It's it's never um, you know. It's never oh well. If it wanted to talk to me, it would appear. Maybe it's you. You know. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's maybe it's trying to get your attention, and you're just like you know. Thick as a brick, or have um, the wall put up? Yeah, I mean one of those right, two. You know? Yeah, I mean I have seen people conjure spirits using traditional methods, mm-hmm. and they'll just sit there and they'll shout and they'll yell and they'll read the conjuration and then they'll stop for like a second and then read it again because the spirit didn't appear. It's like, dude, shut up a minute. Let the spirit get a word in edgewise. It's like, <laughs> How do you know it's not there? You didn't even give it a chance. Exactly. Like, it's coming from another freaking dimension for crying out loud. Maybe, mm-hmm. you, can, you know, give it a second. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I don't have much of a second left, but um, in the meantime, give everybody your um, your website address so they can go on and talk, you know, learn about the classes and the books and all kinds of stuff. StrategicSorcery.net. That's where you want to be to find me. I've got a newsletter, and that will keep you. If you sign up for that Monday Magic newsletter, it will keep you in the loop for everything that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's there's Arcane Audios that you can just buy. They're like 60 bucks a pop. You can buy them, like a nice three-hour-long class. I've got courses on there, uh, books on there, and you name it. Actually, you just reminded me. I didn't even update the website with my newest book. How well, embarrassing you, is that? I noticed that, but I didn't want to say anything. Anyway, um, <laughs> we do have to go. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's come back and talk a little bit more about this down the line because there's Anytime. so much to talk about. And so thanks for popping in. I know you're busy and, and getting stuff going, and I appreciate it. And um, let's thank everybody for listening in as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. 
Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 